So I, I would have given you a longer and more robust introduction. That was more than enough. But per our phones, we could lose power at like any second. <laughs> so, so let's just get on with it. Um, thanks for being here. So part of your title has the phrase emerging technologies in it. And emerging technologies are near and dear to the hearts of many of the people who are attending and who are watching. We have people who have been responsible for some of these emerging technologies. So I'll give you an example of one. And part of the reason I mentioned it is a year ago, I interviewed on this very stage the commissioner, uh, the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Gary Gensler, and we talked about cryptocurrency, and people talked about it all the time, and there's been some discussion about it. And, and so a preliminary question I have before we talk about the threats and the issues that arise from crypto, and I don't know if, if you're in a position to answer it, does the White House, the SEC has a certain view, does the White House have a view on whether crypto is good or not good? It's a really good question. So a couple of months ago, President Biden issued an executive order, which is when the president issues kind of taskings to get the US government to do a series of things on digital assets. And to your point, it talked about balancing a lot of different things that we're trying to accomplish as a country with digital assets. First, increase access to the banking system at lower cost. Allow, for example, an individual who may be a laborer in one country to send remittances home quickly and at a far lower cost. Second, protect consumers, protect investors. Third, counter illicit use of cryptocurrency. You know, a couple of months ago, we saw, for example, Ransom, we see ransomware attacks rising, and a lot of what drives ransomware, yeah. as you know, is the money. Yeah, I'm going to ask about ransomware movement. specifically exactly. in, in a couple of minutes. So in other words, to summarize on your question, yeah. it's good, and there are challenges, and we're trying to both gain the benefits and manage the risks. Good and challenges, but not bad. Absolutely not. Not bad, OK. Um, so one thing that I know the administration has been focusing on is one of the, one of the ways in which cryptocurrency is maybe used in a malign way which is to launder proceeds from cyber attacks. Is that a big deal or not? It's a big deal. As an example, so North Korea launched in 2022 31 ballistic missiles. That's more than was ever launched. Eight were launched in 2021. And we believe roughly a third of the funding, funding the North Koreans ballistic missile program comes from hacking. And over the last couple of years, that's really been hacking cryptocurrency ecosystems. You saw a $620 million hack in February, um, additional ones that uh, may or may not have been North Korea, but we certainly are concerned about given the techniques that were used. And the way and the goal is gaining hard currency to fund the regime. And money is moved through the cryptocurrency ecosystem using mixers, for example, to launder the funds because the blockchain is public. And that's why you've seen some of the things we've done as a US government to try to designate for example, sanction, call yeah. out those mixers who facilitate that funds movement. But that's just one example of how illicit use of crypto is a significant right, concern. Does crypto really exacerbate the problem? Money laundering has been going on for a very, very long time, and hacking has also been going on for a long time, not as long a time as, as money laundering. So is crypto just one of a number of ways in which this happens that you just have to deal with because it's one of 10 things that people do that's wrong? Or does crypto, in the minds of some people, and I wonder if you agree with this or not, present a unique, different kind of threat? I'd love your thoughts on this backstage as well. <laughs> My thoughts on this, it is a unique, different kind of threat because it allows movement of money globally and across borders. And as you know so well, right, to counter traditional money laundering, countries have put in place rules, knowing, know your customer, yeah. anti-money laundering rules, and that whole set of how do you control illicit use of fund hasn't yet come to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Countries are starting to partner together. Countries are starting to hold exchanges accountable to say when somebody opens an account, who are they, and doing some bit of homework, which enables the illicit use, the, the OK use, yeah. and helps us catch. So how does the White House, where you work, coordinate with or make suggestions to the other agencies in the government, including independent agencies like the SEC? It's a great question. So first, how we do it across US government, and then I would also say, how do we do it coordinating globally around the, the world? world? Well, that's right? a whole other yeah. harder thing, right? Yeah. 
but it's a global world, so at the end of the day, we're only going to be so effective. Even as, even as the large US government, we need partners around the world moving with us. So from a US government perspective, I'll use ransomware as an example, right? So we have five components to how we work to tackle ransomware. First is we work with countries around the world. So at the end of October, we'll be bringing 36 countries from 30 different time zones to DC to talk about implementing Know Your Customer rules, to talk about how you do blockchain analysis, to talk about digital infrastructure, how they build their own digital infrastructure to give access from a banking perspective. The second part of that is diplomacy. Right? working with countries around the world to say, if there are countries that are harboring criminals, for example, or harboring individuals who are moving funds in illegal ways, work with us to help bring them to justice. Resilience, improving cybersecurity. Disruption, trying to find the criminal actors who are doing this so that we can also you know, bring down that infrastructure that supports it. So those are all parts of the approach for around the world and for the US government, that executive order I pointed to earlier, which lays out a number of requests for Treasury, for the Fed, for OSTP, talking about what is the energy use of crypto mining, and lays all of that out and then brings it back together so that yeah. we balance the different goals See, we stand. When you're having conversations and uh, developing and implementing policies about crypto, do you think or articulate um, directly that you believe crypto is here to stay, it has some permanence, or do you not think about that? We that's the question people have. Like, yeah, will crypto a be a thing in 10 years? I think many, I agree that I think it will be, mm -hmm. or 15 or 20 years, but does that figure into your policy making? It absolutely does, because we have to be realistic. Look at the size of the crypto market. Yeah. Look at the uses of it today. What we want to do is, as I said earlier, make sure that people can get the benefits and protect consumers, investors, individuals who may be fleeced by a ransomware attacks from it. So absolutely, it's here to stay. I want to get to a new thing um, that I think is not getting enough attention. You know, I talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Quantum computing. This is three guys think that's funny. <laughs> um, maybe they know something we don't know. Um, you have called quantum computing, uh, a, a nuclear threat to cybersecurity, one thing among others that, that quantum computing will cause, particularly if an adversary like China or some other adversary develops the ability to engage in quantum computing before us, or even if it's not before us, is basically to make all encryption, modern day current encryption obsolete. What did you mean when you said it's a nuclear threat to cybersecurity? So there are two core kinds of encryption. There is asymmetric or public key encryption, the kind we do when we go shopping online, right? It's transparent to us. When we click, we see the little um, locket, and we know we're having a secure transaction. The underpinning math and algorithms relies on a core math principle that if you have really large numbers, if you multiply those two numbers to get to an even larger number, it takes a very long time yeah. to figure out what those two beginning numbers are. Right, and, and the, the genius of quantum computing, if it's achieved, and everyone thinks it will be in some single digit number of years, is that that kind of math, those kinds Falls. of computations can be done dramatically quicker, more Dramatically quicker. faster right. to where that kind of encryption can be broken. Right, and it, so um, what is your level of concern, it sounds like a high level of concern, what is your level of concern on the encryption issue if China gets there first, or does it not matter? Encryption protects commerce online. Encryption protects our privacy. Coming out of the intelligence community, encryption protects our national secrets. So it's a real concern. It's a concern enough that we've begun the transition in the US government to what's called post-quantum cryptography, cryptography that can defend against a quantum computer. You may have seen earlier this summer, NIST released the first four algorithms. NIST? Yes, yeah. the National Institute stand for? for Standards and Technology, okay. thank you, is, is part of the Department Even of Commerce. Even this group doesn't know every acronym. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. And, um, and they released those first four algorithms that can withstand the assault of a quantum computer. Now, transitioning the entire crypto ecosystem in our routers, in our firewalls, in our browsers, to that kind of cryptography will take some time. It's kind of thinking about Y2K. Yeah, I was, gonna, exactly. So I was, I was exactly what I was thinking. If Y2 boots turned out to be a bust, or is that because we did a great job? I don't remember, I was younger then. Uh, 
If Y2K, still young. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if Y2K was, just for the sake of argument, a five on a scale of one to 10 in terms of complexity and problem, what's this? Depends how well we prepare, mm -hmm. and depends really on the work that happens between technologists in government and in the private sector working to make that transition. It's a hugely cool opportunity. So it's a nine? Pretty much. <laughs> I, I just wanted a number. Um, so you're talking about going, for, so going forward, are you fairly optimistic about the, at least the US governments and, and US business, their ability to protect information going forward and encrypt in a new way? Like, are you pretty comp confident about that? It will be a, a lot of work. What I can say is we've started that work right. and are rallying. You're not going to commit. I will How many commit. years is it going to take? We estimate it'll take, well, the last time we as a country did that kind of a major encryption transition, it took us a decade. And we believe we have a decade until you think we do? potentially an adversary has a quantum computer. But, but. we've started. You asked a really interesting question, which is some of the data we have is transient. We don't really care if it you know, lasts a moment. So for example, the path I'll take to get from here to the airport, right? That right. will that's change. That's actually, that's important for It you. only matters for a few moments. <laughs> right. Versus, for example, intelligence secrets, yeah. which could be of interest to another country 10 years from now. So that's one of the reasons why we believe some countries around the world are starting to store even encrypted data with right. the belief. So that's the pro so, so the big problem that I think is underappreciated, except for the three guys over there, is that there's already been an exfiltration of tremendous amounts of US and other countries' secrets and corporations' intellectual property, including the pharmaceutical industry and other industries, that the Chinese government, among others perhaps, is just waiting for quantum to show up so they can exploit that and they can get all those secrets. Is there anything that the government is doing to mitigate the damage that that would cause? So first, there are a lot of ifs there, yeah. right? A quantum computer. Like three ifs. Right. right. There are major ifs in that can it be done, the technology, the science, the chemical science, the material science, there's a lot there. The physics of that, you know, it, uh, there's a lot there. But what we can do today is first, it's part of why NIST released the algorithms, it's part of why they'll be standardizing on them within a couple of years, because that starts everybody beginning in this transition. And a lot of the most important US government secrets actually use the other kind of cryptography called symmetric cryptography. Yeah, that's better. Exactly. And, and, and uh, how would you like compare? Like command and control. So as a result, we're okay. just concerned about that. How do you compare the, uh, the planning and the outlook for government sensitive information and encryption going forward compared to the private sector? They're com incredibly closely tied yeah. because the tech of post-quantum cryptography, taking those algorithms, as you know, right, the first step is having the cryptographic algorithms that we have mathematical confidence in, but then it's actually implementing them, thinking about how keys are exchanged, thinking about how they're distributed. The great example really is our browser when we're doing a transaction online. People don't have to think about it, it just happens. So that work that will need to happen between technologists is really the same overall. There's just an extra sensitivity in government because there's data that needs to be protected today, yeah. which is why we've started the transition already. Okay. So you mentioned ransomware already. I would imagine that there are some folks in this room for whom ransomware has already been an actual crisis to deal with. Mm -hmm. and for many folks in this room and who are watching, it's a looming potential problem, right? It's, it's on, the, on the rise, am I correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and it presents a very severe dilemma for folks in the private sector and I guess the public sector too. Do you have a view or does the White House have a view on whether or not they, do they advocate not paying ransomware, paying it sometimes, never paying it, what's, what's the advice to folks here if they are the victims of a ransomware attack? It's a tough question that we actively debated across the US government just about a year ago. And we were actively debating it because the idea of paying ransoms, think about it in the human context, right? The idea is I'm that- I'm against it. Good, Generally, so but, there's a, but, but, but it's problematic, right? Because it people is. have businesses to run. 
So what was the conclusion of yep. the debate? So I was referencing it in the human context because the thinking there was that if you pay a ransom, you're incentivizing the next act and the next act right. and the next but act. But against a different right? victim. Agreed. Right. I see your point about the moral hazard. Yeah. But we ultimately made a decision not to ban ransom payments because there was the sense that there are, it is so hard and so much more work needs to be done to improve the security of tech, to improve the cybersecurity of systems, that we'd essentially be pressing victims to make their payments go undercover, yeah. instead of having them reach out, ask for support, and get that support to recover quickly. So, so you said that, at, at least at this moment, a decision to ban the payment of ransomware was taken off the table, but do you have guidance? we actively, actively discourage it. So here's the guidance, right? First, right. there's basic cybersecurity practices, yeah. which is to say, back up and keep your backups offline. So if your systems are locked and encrypted, you've got a backup and you can recover. The second are the cybersecurity practices we all know about, right? Use multi-factor authentication, encrypt your data on your own. So even if an, if an attacker gets access to a network and they get the data, they can't break it for all the reasons we've just talked about from an encryption perspective. So our first really strongest request is do those practices, because then you really are protected against only the most sophisticated attackers. And then beyond that, if somebody does get hit, reach out to the FBI or CISA. As the, as the Los Angeles Unified uh, School District did over the weekend, and we will surge support to help you recover. So there are various incentives to pay the ransomware or not. Um, some of them are obvious. Do you have a view on whether insurance companies should be in the business of, because it's a matter, it's a risk, or the, the, a ransomware attack, if it hasn't happened to you yet, may happen and you assess the, the likelihood of that happening, and for all other kinds of risk, flooding and everything else, power going out, you buy insurance. Do you have a, does the White House have a view on whether or not insurance companies should provide coverage against ransomware? They actively should not pay a ransom, but insurance companies play a, can play a really big role. Here's an example, right? Yeah. You know, if we have home insurance, that home insurance is contingent on having an alarm system, having smoke detectors installed, right? They're giving you the practices you need to stay safe. Similarly, when, you know, folks who have car insurance, right, individuals who are reckless drivers will have a harder time and pay more right. to get car insurance. And we think similarly, where insurance can incentivize good cybersecurity practices is you know, companies that have their data encrypted, companies that do, or individuals that do right. use two ways of authenticating can, should have lower premiums and lower insurance. Right. But if the insurance companies get into this, that's gonna be a lot more, pay, assuming these other conditions are met, and, they, and the companies care about these conditions as a business proposition, that means a lot more ransomware is gonna get paid. Do you worry that that means there's gonna be a lot more ransomware attacking? We believe that if insurance companies made higher thresholds for if you want to buy insurance, you've got to do these things. That makes it a lot harder for attackers because many attackers are using vulnerabilities that are known, where there are patches available. If we can raise the bar to where an attacker has to come up with something new each time, yeah. we would see the number of attacks dramatically fall. It's okay. way too easy today. So don't pay it, get insurance. Um, I want to talk about infrastructure and part of your portfolio is protecting U.S. infrastructure against cyber attack. And by the way, this is something that has been talked about for a long time. I became the U.S. attorney 13 years ago. And as far back as that, um, I and others in the, at the top of the government and law enforcement and the intelligence communities have been warning against the safety and security of our infrastructure. But nothing major has really happened. And I, I wonder after so much time, are we, have we overblown the pro have we overstated the problem? Are we actually pretty secure or not? So I'd love for you to ask that question to the fantastic team at um, the LA Unified School District, FBI, and LA P Police Department, yeah. who spent much of this weekend um, trying to recover from a crippling ransomware attack so school could open this morning. Right, but that's not a, and, and that's, that's a very significant thing, but I'm speaking about dams and bridges yep and the power grid that we keep talking about. Are we okay on that or not? We're one of the last countries in the world to have minimum cybersecurity standards for our critical infrastructure. So today, for example, if you operate an oil and gas pipeline 
until a year ago when we put in place cybersecurity minimum mandates, and they're basic things like have an incident response plan, patch your systems within a certain period of time, et cetera, there were no requirements for critical oil and gas pipelines. Okay. And similarly, in our water sector, we're working now to put in place those requirements. So here's what I would say. Until we have minimum cybersecurity mandates across the largest critical infrastructure, you know, there are 96 oil and gas pipelines that are the largest. They serve either they transport hazardous materials or they serve a certain number of Americans. Those are the ones that we say the harm that could be caused by a disruption or destruction akin to what occurred with Colonial Gas Pipeline last year is so significant that we need you as a partner to put these requirements in place. So we're working through that sector by sector because every sector looks yeah. different. And I think until those are in place, we won't feel that we have the confidence to let Americans know that that infrastructure is at least, you know, you've locked your digital doors, you've locked your windows, you've yeah. put on an alarm to know that you can rapidly detect an attacker and capture it before it causes harm. I have one or two more questions, but then we have, to, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience, so think about your questions. Um, with respect to who our cyber adversaries are, and I know you talked about this and you get asked about this all the time, but for this group, which countries are you most concerned about? Should we be most concerned about? And they include, obviously, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, which I think combined has the computing power of like a Commodore 64, can still engage in cyber attacks. We had the Sony hack a few years ago. Just very, very succinctly, where's the greatest threat coming from with respect to other countries? You know, each of the countries you talked about use cyber attacks to achieve a different goal, right? The Chinese have one of the largest programs. We see a real focus on stealing tech from countries yeah. around the world to really advantage their companies. Similarly, from a military doctrine perspective, they really see disrupting critical infrastructure as a way to get a population to not support you know, countries engaging in conflict. On the North Korea side, we talked about, you know, ironically enough, what's so fascinating about North Korea is, as you said, right? You look at a picture at night, I they're mean, pretty dark. They have like three computers. On the other hand, some of the most you know, really innovative attacks on crypto infrastructure, right? Using the gig economy to glean money for the state happens in North Korea. Yeah. So, you know, that's certainly... Because they have to be resourceful. It's true. Yeah. It drives um, them that way. My, my last question, then we'll go to the audience. So obviously in your position, it's very sensitive, and you deal with classified information, top secret information, which obviously you cannot talk about. My question is, w would you have been able to talk about that stuff if we did code at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> All right, that was a joke question. Next it's question. not a real question. But you know, I you knew wonder. We had to get that in there. <laughs> okay, other people. I, I have a question. Yeah, sir. Hi, um, and, 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 and be brief. We don't have a lot of time. And say who you are and your question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Frederick from Sweden. Soon a proud member of the NATO, hopefully. Soon uh, to be. Yeah. Um, just a funny fact before I ask my question, the four countries we're talking about here, if you combine them in the Swedish word, it gets war. Interesting. Sorry to say. Uh, I'm asking you about the war in Ukraine driven by Putin, that today this morning I got the information that he was supported with new weapon systems supported by North Korea, probably actually paid by this interest. When are we coming to the D-Day time for the U.S. to actually shut these four countries down from this technology level of usage? That's actually what I'm asking for, because we can give a lot of weapons to Ukraine, we can help Europe with a lot of weapons, but the most effective thing would probably be, hopefully not as in here now, putting the power down, but putting the internet down for them in certain levels, and hopefully we have that capabilities today, and when are the time for Washington to take the decision we're going to shut them down in order to stop this shit? Sorry to use that word. You know, the war in Ukraine is painful for everybody to watch, right? The death and destruction of what was Putin's voluntary war. As a community of countries, we've chosen to first use economic sanctions as really an economic weapon because of a war has to be funded, soldiers have to be paid, weapons have to be built and replenished. And you've seen these have been 
the broadest in terms of the number of countries participating and deepest sanctions that have ever been put on a country. And frankly, they've held. And what's been amazing is they've held through Russia responding with its energy weapon, right? You've seen Gazprom, a major Russian company, turn off energy for maintenance and other purposes. And we all know now this is the summer and the winter is coming as well. So as part of the broader, what is our broader goal? Our broader goal is making clear that one country cannot invade another country and that a community of countries will use the tools at their power to fight that. And I think you see it in the security assistance, you see it in the economic sanctions, and frankly, you see it in the fact that since the invasion in February, the community of countries fighting that has continued to be arm in arm. And of course, we all want this, uh, the conflict to be over because of that death and destruction, but you see the commitment of countries working together. What may come may come, but we certainly are pressing for the conflict to conclude. Sorry for asking again, but can we put down the internet for part of them? I think the larger goal is how do we stop the war, right? How do we get Russia to pull out? And I think looking at what are the right weapons and what are the right tools to do that is really the question we're focused it, on. No more follow-up. Weapon usable? Sorry. Okay, thank you for that. Let's, thank let's you. Try to get, uh, I think we only have another few seconds. Yeah. There's I have no one question back here. Um, yeah. With uh, tornado cash coming onto the sanctions of the Treasury Department, uh, but before that, thank you for your service. Really appreciate you being here, and thank you for serving our country. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, a lot of us in the tech community believe that code is free speech and that it is constitutionally protected under the First Amendment. Um, what do you guys say to that argument that code is free speech and then providing these types of sanctions that are pretty much a violation of that First Amendment? It's such a good question. And I'll, I'll talk to that in a moment. I do first want to say, because a speaker earlier today talked about America and his belief in America. And to your point, saying thank you, I owe a tremendous debt to this country. My parents, my dad came as a refugee, my grandparents came as refugees. So every day I give thanks that I have the opportunity to pay back a tiny part of that debt. So, so to the question, so for the broader group, Tornado.cash is a mixer. It's a kind of, it's actually really interesting, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so it's not one entity. Because the blockchain is public, you can see every transaction. So if an entity is trying to illicitly move money, there has to be a way to hide it. So these mixers take a bunch of different transactions and mix them together with the goal of hiding some. Tornado.cash was really interesting because when you talk about the North Koreans hack I mentioned earlier, which gleaned $620 million in crypto, you need a lot of funds to be able to launder that kind of money through, a lot of liquidity. And Tornado.cash was one of the only ones that, had, that was large enough to have that kind of liquidity. So that just explains just a bit of, of the question. And the Treasury Department designated them because they facilitated laundering in three attacks on crypto infrastructure in quick succession in February, um, in February May, and, and July. The question asked here is, for the reason we just talked about, given the blockchain is public, for genuine needs to protect transactions, when we designate a mixer like that, that also impacts legitimate use. So the reason we give a lot of thought, Treasury Department gives a lot of thought before doing those designations is to say, is this mixer, there are many different mixers, unique in its enabling of harm? And the degree of liquidity Tornado had and the fact that it was repeatedly used by the North Koreans made it, and because of what we know, as I mentioned earlier, what the North Koreans are using this money for, we said we need to not make that be an option. There are many other mixers, smaller mixers, who we believe will step in to facilitate legitimate transactions. And we also are really calling for crypto exchanges, as I mentioned earlier, to implement those know your customer rules, to ask questions about who is, so that legitimate uses to protect privacy and to protect transactions are enabled and illegitimate are not. I'm glad you um, were ending on mixers because we're out of time. And there's one more session, I think, between you and mixers. Thank you. I'm repeat what everyone else has said. Thank you for your service. Really appreciate it.